So today, uh, financial literacy part one, money matters, and we're starting off by doing a pre-assessment um, with our students regarding um, why money matters and if they have uh, any budget uh, planning or pre-information. Uh, so we had three people that said yes. Everybody has a budget that we use to track our expenses, so somewhat, okay. Mm -hmm. I know we all had to submit one for the grant aid piece, but um, that can change. And one of the, hopefully one of the things from today's uh, session that you use, if you don't use a budget, to see the implications of why it's important and why we should be using one, okay? Um, number, number two is I've attended a workshop on financial literacy within the last six months to a year. Anybody? No? And the last one I did was freshman year. Freshman year. Okay, so it's been a quick, it's been a quick minute, but yeah. since last you did one. Um, the reason why I ask that question is because it's really important. Financial literacy is something that you're going to continue to work on through, for the rest of your life. Um, by no means am I a master at financial literacy, but I have learned a few tricks of the trade. Um, I have learned some wonderful insights, and you'll see in the presentation we revamped this last year. So it's a lot more, um, I would say, fluid and it, very smooth in terms of um, discussions and working through the information that we have provided. Um, so it is engaging as well. Um, number three, I have personal relationships with my current bank tellers and, and or representatives at my Charleston Bank location. Nobody? Okay. Why would that be important to have um, a personal relationship with your, your banking representative? Anybody? Maybe if you want to open a credit card or something. Okay. Like that. You want to open a credit card. Um, also, it's important to have that relationship because of fraud. You know, this day and age, um, you know, fraud is as common as the common cold. It really happens that easily and readily available. Um, I myself ex we experienced fraud a few years ago, uh, Roar, Roar uh, P card. And to think, to show you how quickly it happens. Um, you know, we had to further through a lot of things. We filed a report for public safety and everything. But it took us a long time to get that money back. So it's really easy for fraud to happen. But for you to reclaim that and reclaim your name, it takes twice as long. So that's why it's really important to have that personal relationship so people know who you are so that doesn't happen. But on occasion, it does happen. All right. How many of you currently have a credit card? So anybody have a credit card? Yeah? Okay. And is, is it for emergencies only, or what do you, what do you, what do you use it for? Well, I don't use it. You don't use it at all? So you just my, have it? My mom put one of my names by the bill credit, but I never use it for okay. She uses it. <laughs> she uses it to stick Sometimes. Okay. And then just pay it off. All right, so you have that little cushion just in case you do have it. It's kind of mm -hmm. nice. Okay. Um, most people usually get a credit card for the first time in college so that you can start building credit because we all know that it is a lot easier. Come in. Oh. Somebody obviously didn't. Right. Um, so we're just having a conversation right now about um, credit and why why it's important. So, um, so establishing credit is important, but you know we all know that if you don't have any credit, how do you get credit, right? Well, you got to start earning points and building up that credit, which is really really important. That's why having a credit card um, is one of those things that you have to do. Um, do I particularly like credit cards? No, I don't because of the outrageous interest rates, especially nowadays. But, you know, having one and paying one off to make sure that you don't have a carryover balance is kind of a smart way because that you can build up instant credit. And that way when you go to buy real things like buying a car, purchasing a car, a house, um, those things really can help you overall make sure in your, in your financial plan. Yes? This is so wonderful, but I just got a, a text message from my phone here is saying you get a 20 hour bonus and we make the deal with you get a prepaid car with us. Okay. I'm pretty sure it has a high interest rate. Yeah, I'm, pre <laughs> I'm pretty sure. So, you know, there always, there's always a gimmick. Um, one thing that you guys never had to experience in, in college that I had to experience as an undergrad is they passed a law that kept credit card companies from coming to campus. So when I was an undergrad, they would be lined up down the student union and they would get individuals to purchase. They would get you a free shirt. Sign up with us, get a free shirt, get this free tote bag or something, whatever. And they would give you all, these, all this swag and then you'd be signed for a, a credit card. And next thing you know, you have this lovely interest rate that you have. So it has its pros and also cons, but they did pass a bill that, didn't, that does not allow credit card companies to do that anymore, which is kind of nice because you know, really, how many college students really think about that on a daily basis, right? You guys are going to class to and from, you're not thinking about, okay, I'm gonna build credit today, I'm gonna sign for this credit card. So uh, I think it's really beneficial that, that we, we have that law now to keep that from going on. 
Um, how many of you are currently attending college at Charleston using subsidized or unsubsidized loans? Okay, all right. Um, and that's an important thing because once again, that you're also building credit right now. Um, obviously, what's the main difference between subsidized and unsubsidized? Unsubsidized accumulates loans, accumulates interest while you're in school. Mm -hmm. You're right. So one of them is the government is paying as long as you're in school, and then six months after you graduate, you start incurring interest. The other one, you're incurring interest from day one. So um, it's always nice to get the other, the latter. That way, you don't have to have incurred that. You can pay it off. Now, that's not saying that as you go through this, um, you can learn some smart money management um, tips. And one of the tips that we'll talk about is what about if you, if you are doing um, subsidized or unsubsidized loans, starting to pay little small increments, which I think builds, starts to build up your credit and also keeps you ahead of the game and then you have less to pay on the, on the back end, right? All right, um, continuing on, uh, how many of you keep track of your purchases and what money you have in your personal account on a regular basis? So you're checking, like a regular basis, how, I said, how many of you keep track of your purchases and what money you have in your personal account on a regular basis? So, okay. Banking, right. Text bank, that's Text bank, so use the app. There's a lot of great apps now yeah. where you can that are tied direct, sync directly to your bank so you can go in and you can calculate things and you can see your spending habits, if you went over this month, if you went under, if you didn't do as well. So it's a lot more user friendly now, I think, um, in terms of technologically advancements to help us uh, manage our money. Um, how many of you have at least $50 in a savings account right now? Okay. Savings, so very nice. Very, very important to have that as well for the, the rainy day fund. Um, they always say that you, according to um, the lovely guru of um, Dave Ramsey, says you should have at least three months um, income in a savings account just for a rainy day. Okay. Now, do most people have that? No. Do, do I have that? No. Do I want to have that? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, but as we go forward, you have to pay off things. You have to have the mortgage. You have a car payment. You've got student loans. So it makes it a little bit more challenging. But if you start out with something small, like $50, you go up to $75 to $100, and you get it taken out you know, prior to you actually getting paid every month or every, every two weeks, you never really see it. And then it goes directly into an account, and then it starts incurring interest. And you know, before you know too long, you've got over $1,000, $2,000 something dollars in your account which is kind of nice. Um, how many of you utilize coupons and our, the coupon savers? Yeah, okay. I, I'm definitely one of those. Um, one of our former students, Terry Ridges, was the queen of couponing. I, I have not mastered her system. Her system is like to a science, it's down to a T. It, it, it blew me away how, how intricate it was. Uh, but you know, she always would cut coupons uh, every Sunday. That would be one of her things. And she had this big book that she kept everything in. And it was, it was pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. A little tidbit, our president actually is a couponer. I didn't know that. So good old Glenn, Mr. McConnell, is a couponer too. So I found that out from a conversation I had with some of the other staff members here at CFC. Um, how many of you use our public transit as a form of cost reduction for your for payment? Yeah, okay, I do too. Um, even though I think we need to improve it right now for in terms of congestion, but I do think it's very beneficial because it's free. I mean, you can, you can rack and ride is what they call it. You park, catch the express, head downtown, do your business, get on the express and go back home. Uh, it usually takes about 15 to 20 minutes, but you save the hassle of being in traffic, you save money, you know, it kind of builds up, it occurs over time. And also, you can also get a cost savings on your insurance too, if you draw or drive less than two miles a day to and from work. So it, it is very beneficial. Uh, how many of you have a line in your budget for entertainment? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. How much money per, per, per month do you usually keep in that line? Um, I usually do it by percentage, so I try to do like 15%. Okay. So do you kind of change that? Does it go up or down depending on what time of the year it yeah, is? Yeah, my birthday's coming up in two weeks, so it's going to go up. Um, so yeah, it depends on the time of the year. Okay. So you kind of kind of play it by what time of year it is, mm -hmm. how much it is. Okay, cool. Um, those are just some information that we like to take in for the pre-assessment to kind of figure out where you're at right now. And I need to get you a packet right here. If you come on down, Angela. Miss Angela. And you'll sign in too for me. Pass that back. Take that with you. You can sign it. Yeah. Oh, that's for you. Did you get the pen or do you need one? Okay, cool. All right. So, 
So talking about money matters, we need to introduce some key concepts to make sure that we all understand why money matters, the process, and how fluid it is working with our budget. Uh, we need to understand how we're handling our money. Uh, we'll, if we have a full time, we might be a little icebreaker. Uh, we'll go through the PowerPoint, Managing Your Money. So this PowerPoint, um, we got this information from one of the sort, national sources for student um, aid support for managing your money, for budgeting. And we kind of revamped a little bit for particular pieces. Um, and there was another workshop that a, um, another bank group that did. I really like some key components of that. So we kind of, kind of amalgamated some things and put it together to be a more working fluid uh, workshop. Um, we'll be actually playing a game called Money Into Your Money Game. So we're going to be kind of this thing where you're going to get money and you're going to have to balance your budget. And guess what? You have this lovely thing called life events that happen where they're unexpected things. You don't know that happen where you have to lose money or you gain money depending on what happens. All right? So the kind of the game of chance. And then we'll talk about the debrief for Money Matters. Um, I always recommend students, if you're working from the budget, because I did ask everybody to do a budget for our little grant aid, if you want to work on that, you know, I would definitely encourage you to do a follow-up with me so we can sit down and kind of go over it and what it looks like for you for this year, more particularly for your situation. And then we're going to revisit our initial budget that we created and answer any questions. All right. So first of all, there's key concepts. So when you talk about financial planning, there are so many concepts out there that you cannot cover all the concepts in one day. There's just, it's just not feasible. But when you're talking about the basics about budgeting and why financial planning is important, there's a few things we want to look at. So first of all, we'll talk about the financial basics. We'll look at the budgeting and financial planning, overspending, uh, banking your money, dealing with debt and credit cards, mixing money and, and family, which we know can be kind of that taboo area, right? Uh, protecting your credit, and loans, preventing identity theft, avoiding quick financial fixes, setting financial goals. Yes, I think it's important that we set financial goals for self. Uh, the future's up to you, forecasting your financial uh, future, independence, and then saving money. Okay? So just a few of the things that we'll cover throughout the presentation today. Now, I always like to kind of give this perspective. When you think about this quote, millionaires become millionaires by budgeting and controlling their expenses and they maintain their affluent status the same way. What are your thoughts about that quote? Millionaires become millionaires by budgeting and controlling expenses, and they maintain their affluent status the same way. What percentage of millionaires? The percentage of millionaires? Okay. I mean, I, I, know. I won't answer it from a... The 1% mindset. The 1% mindset? Okay. Yeah. Most, no, and any, any, any feedback that you get is very important. Okay, well, most wealth is inherited. It's like your okay. grandfather's, your grandfather's money, your father's money, so forth. Right, so it's, usually it's... It's, American dream of working it's usually generational, right? Yeah, yeah. Generational. Okay. Now, what about those individuals who didn't have that generational piece? Yeah. That built it up? Like a Steve Jobs. Yeah, like a Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect, exa prime mm -hmm. example. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, they started at the ground up working in grunt work and then going to IT and then kind of um, building up their empire to where they are today, right? It can happen. Um, I think another great uh, individual, and he's not really a financial guru, but I like his example of how you can rise above, is President Lyndon B. Johnson. You know, most people don't know that he was born into poverty. Uh, he was one of the only presidents of the United States that was ever in an impoverished area and helped kind of rise above. Um, he was always the underdog, the person that people always second guess and like, oh, you'll never be more than you are. You're just that poor kid, you know, just stay there. And he's like, no, I, I can become affluent. I can become a well-rounded individual and be, um, be productive and, and, you know, have money. And, of course, he rose to the top of his education, went to law school on a scholarship, you know, graduated from law school. And eventually, you know, by chance, he became president of the United States after the assassination of Kennedy. So, and he was really kind of the forefather that was focusing on the financial literacy piece as we kind of come through this because, um, you know, he's the one that started TRIO, the TRIO movement, which is what we were, we were originally belonged to um, in terms of TRIO access programs. He's the one that started that whole idea and conversation about trying to eradicate poverty in this country. So I think that's kind of really interesting. But it's a really interesting quote. I like the quote because it kind of brings your mind a little bit of awareness about where we are and kind of what state we're in currently in right now. All right. All right, so money matters continue. 
So first of all, the conversation piece, why does money matter? I'll put it out there. So why does money matter? And this is not a rhetorical question, so um, it, there's no right or wrong answer. I just want a conversational piece with everybody. So why does money matter? Because people require things in life that you can only get with money. Okay, so people require, so people are trying to acquire materialistic goods, and in order to get those goods, you have to have money, right? Okay. That's why money makes the world go around. Money makes the world go around. Now, how many of you are aware of what's going on with us in China? The debt. Lots of debt. Well, lots of debt. But how many, China is actually trying to depression the dollar, devalue our dollar right now. There's a, there's a, a, Really, it's a battle of the, of the of finances right now. Mm -hmm. China's trying to devalue the dollar. The United States is retaliating by putting more money into the dollar and, and offsetting the yen. So it's kind of this, ba this battle on Wall Street, mm -hmm. a battle of finances. So, and most people don't even know that's going on right now, but that directly impacts us because if that goes down or goes up, what happens to the market with, in terms of groceries? What happens then? It goes up, right? The price of milk, the price of uh, vegetables, whatever, goes up depending on what the market rates look like. Um, why should we be concerned with financial matters as a young college student? Why is that important to have that conversation now? Do you think a lot of your peers are in the classes just thinking about this right now? Like financial planning, financial literacy, this is important. Any of your friends talk about this on a regular basis? No. Okay. And that, that's one of the things I'm trying to bring up is that it's not a common theme for young people to talk about. You know, usually most people learn about financial literacy from workshops like this, where you're engaging with somebody who's talking about awareness, talking about why it's important and bringing that to the forefront. Whereas most people will just kind of go through life and, you know, they'll have successes, ups and downs, and then there'll be a time when mom and dad, you know, decide to cut the cord and allow them to kind of stand on their own two feet. So, you know, and the question is, you know, will you be ready when that happens? You know, and so that's why we're doing financial planning, financial literacy. It's important um, to have that con con uh, conversation. So as a college student right now, why should we be concerned about financial matters? Because college is expensive and there's a lot of cost them. <laughs> college is expensive. And it's not getting any cheaper, right? So... Um, college can, co cost of uh, college education continues to rise, and right now with the college Charleston, we don't have a we don't have a reduction plan. We don't have anything in place to offset that because if the cost keeps going up, you know people can't afford it. You know you want to have a diverse group of students. You want to have a group diverse campus community. You want to you know have access to the college education. Well, if, if tuition keeps going up. You know, people are going to say, College of Charleston is not in my sphere of schools I'm even looking at, right? Mm -hmm. So why would I even want to go here? Because if I go here, I can't afford it. So that's one thing I think in the long run that's going to be really uh, instrumental for us to look as a college, as a, as a, a university, um, to really focus on. Because, you know, we will drive away our consumer. We will drive away college students, um, you know, who are from um, areas, different areas. So the majority of college students that we get right now from the college students uh, who are, I guess, in the 1%, usually is around New Jersey or Boston. So we usually get a really upper East Coast. A lot of those students come here. Um, we see a lot of students from the Buckeye State, from Ohio, Upper Ohio, Cincinnati area, Louisville, Kentucky. I love you can see some few kids, students from like Hawaii come out here, come, you know, come to College of Charleston. So it really depends. Um, now, how well are you currently handling your money right now? So are, you, are we doing okay handling money so far this semester? Mm -hmm. Anybody go overspending or underspend? Yeah? Sometimes. Sometimes, okay. What's usually one of those driving factors, Julia? What, what's usually one of those things that where you're like, oh, I made that, I, made, I goofed up this month or I goofed up this week. What, what's usually that driving factor? Spend a lot of money on shopping. Shopping, okay, shopping. So materialistic things, right? And that's that's common. That's a very normal thing for young ladies to do, um, as well as gentlemen. Um, one of the things that I think we'll talk about a little bit later is the psychology behind spending. That's a really interesting concept. Um, and they always tell you, don't go grocery shopping or don't go shopping when you are really, really happy or really, really sad. 
do you want to go in between? Because you'll overspend. Yeah, you'll 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 overspend every single time. If you're if you're if you're depressed or if you're too happy, because it kind of balances out. But they recommend in psychology, um, in terms of not to fix the whole the whole going out and spending splurges that happen. Um, do it when you're kind of at that medium, that common level. Okay. Just some concepts and things to be to be aware about as we go forward. Now, the financial literacy why is important. So here you are. And I think this little, little, little diagram is kind of representative of where you are. So college students up here, you're on the, on the teeter-totter, uh, which we don't usually see very often anymore on playgrounds, but the teeter-totter or the, the seesaw, your college student over here on one side, and then on the other side you have starting out right in a smaller circle, and then you have your college education, a larger one. What does that represent, you think? What does it, what does it say to you? Having you as over college on this side, and then having starting out right as a smaller circle and a larger circle with college education. It's hard for a college student to balance that out. Absolutely. So, so basically, you are playing this balancing act right now. You're trying to afford the cost of rising tuition, books, room and board. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's not feasible for a lot of our students to live on on the campus. You have to go and commute. Why? Because it's actually cheaper. I mean, some of the rents and things that you pay for a room and board for a semester is ridiculous, like over two thousand dollars. You know, that's not that's not cost effective. Yeah, I save sixty percent. It sounds like that much. I save fifteen percent, but no, I save like sixty percent moving to West Ashley. Yeah. Compared so, to living on campus and getting yeah. a get no roommate. You know, and um, not only that, but if you look at where we are in the you know in the country, mm -hmm. there's you know, cost of living is kind of right now is kind of getting out of control. Like, mm -hmm. like Mount Pleasant just is raising their rates. So I know someone who had an apartment where their their rent was approximately about eight sixty a month. Mm -hmm. They're paying sixteen hundred now. Mm -hmm. So it's it's more than doubled in the last year. Um, you know, I can't I can't imagine that paying sixteen hundred dollars for for rent for a, a one bedroom. I just think that's I would find a place to live. You know, but. Exactly right. Where you are as college students, it is it is challenging to have the balancing act of life. But it's something that we all need to do. We all have to learn how to do. So um, starting out right is a smaller circle than your college education. Because right now there's a lot of debate whether, you know, it is, in fact, students should go to college to get your education, right? There's actually a really big discussion going on right now. Should students go for a technical vocational school? Or should they go to get a regular college education, right? So there's benefits and cons. I think it really depends on what you want to do. So if you're wanting to go on and do a professional career, you know, you need college as that sounding board um, to kind of enculturate you to kind of get you ready for that foundational piece to go on and do bigger and better things. Now, if you're wanting to get a job and get, you know, get a certification or get, you know, training, job training, then yeah, probably a vocational technical school is probably right for you. But uh, I think this right now is a really interesting piece of where we are um, in the discussion for the, the rising cost of education, how it affects college students, and kind of what our outlook is right now. So. All right, so here we go for a little example. So smart credit, the average credit. So graduating, an average graduating college student has blank in credit card debt. How much you think? This has kind of gone up a little bit, depending on where we are right now. I say four thousand. A four thousand? Is that high? I'm just taking a guess right now. Anybody? Yes. Probably, probably maybe a thousand. It's not that high. Thousand. In my opinion. So it actually ranges anywhere between two thousand to six thousand dollars, depending okay. on where you are. Okay. So. Um, I think this was probably a little bit higher a few years ago, and now it's kind of become going down a little bit because students are becoming more aware of cost of things and are being a little bit more proactive and being aware, conscious, right? Um, the average interest rate for student credit cards is around what? Like 12.5. That's low. Yeah. So um, I've seen things as high as 28%. Or 25.5, 25.2 percent, or some really crazy figure. So it really depends on your credit score. It really depends on, you know, first of all, do you have credit? You know, second, you know, what your spending habits are. You know, can you pay on time? Do you pay on time? Do you carry a balance? 
there's a lot of factors that kind of range in there. So, all right, so dropping down here, this is just an example. So purchase price, uh, that outfit right here, jeans, uh, um, a kind of sweater, like Henley hoodie, and then some shoes, uh, $178, uh, get 10% off, so $160.20. Now, if you went to a new outfit on King Street right now, um, what's one of the things that you'll be looking for? Shoes. Shoes, okay. Shoes is always a hot ticket item, right? When is the best time to go buy shoes? Or is there a best time? Between seasons. Between seasons, okay. Like three weeks ago or a month ago. Right. Usually the uh, um, the weekend where they have the t no tax free weekend is always a really good mm -hmm. thing because you get to you don't have to pay the extra ten percent or fifteen percent depending on what it is. That's always a good time. But off season is always a really good place too to kind of look specifically because you're always going to pay more for some of the the, the more name brands. Where you could go to um, like an outlet mall and purchase them for probably equivalent. Or something like Ross and TJ Maxx or Marshalls. Yes. Where it's marked. I like it. Absolutely. Maxx, so, I so it yeah, absolutely. So Ross, TJ Maxx, uh, Marshalls are great options because you can get the same look and same outfit mm -hmm. for a lot less, and it hurts the, the, as they say, it hurts the pocketbook or the the bill, the actual law a lot less mm -hmm. when you're spending more money that's more feasible, right? Okay. All right. Now, uh, managing your money. Let's look at this. Your credit report. So, let's look at this right here. So. What do you think the top 35% is? Well, actually, let's, let's put, take a few minutes to place this in the, in the pocket, okay? To look at this. I was trying to get my thing to print it out, so I didn't, I didn't want to cheat, but I want to make sure I got everything down correctly. So take a, more, a few more minutes to go through that and place down what you feel like it, it is. So, who would like to take a stab at? The 35%? Or anything. You want to take a stab at? Okay, 35%. Let's start there. Mm, debt. Mm. Debt, you think debt? Yeah. Okay. All right, what's next? Mm. Yeah. They're hard to place. What is it? Educational level. How do you put that in The what now? Educational level. So these are just examples right here. So not all of them are correct. So let's start out at the very top. So 35%, you said? Debt. Debt. Is that what everybody says? Yes? Actually, that is incorrect. 35% is payment history. So how much you pay. All right? And when you pay. Okay. What about the 30%? Let's take a stab at it. Debt. Debt? Debt is 35%. Anybody thinks? Um, some of the words are just weird to put into a pie chart because yeah. they don't all like, seem it's like weird. Okay. You're correct. It's debt. So the amount that you owe, right? The amount that you have incurred. Okay. Um, what about the, the blue, the 15%? Salary. salary. You think salary? How many says salary? All right. What was your What was your any any comments? I didn't really have one in mind. Okay, that's okay. Like I said, there's 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 correct answers on this. Um, the fifteen percent is the length of your history. Okay. So what is what does length of history mean? It means when you actually start incurring credit, how long what your payments looks like, how long you've had credit, how long you built it, what you've done, all the various things that go into building credit. Okay. So the length that you have. What about the last two, the red and the orange, the 10 and 10? Salary and job history. Salary and job history? Salary and job history? What do you think? No? Um, it's actually, that, actually, no, it's not correct. New credit and types of credit. You're right. New, new credit and types of credit. So they can kind of be interchangeable. So 10% of that is going to be types of credit. 10% is going to be new credit. Okay? So the 35% itself is the payment history. The 30% is going to be the amount that you owe, the debt that you have, right? The 15% is the length of your credit history. So when you started your credit, how much you paid, and your, kind of your, how you plot that out over the course of your lifetime. 
And then the last two, 10% and 10%, is made up of new credit and types of credit. Okay? How many of you, you knew that? You got it all right. Anybody? What's the 15% again? The 15% is the length of credit history. So I tried to print out a lovely graph of this for you to have to take away, and I'll, I'll send it to you, but our printer's decided to be stupid again today. So I tried three times to print it, and it was not printing. The wheel just kept turning, so I was like, okay, forget it. So I think this is very beneficial to know because when you're starting to look out as a young professional and you go out in the real world and you're looking for um, trying to buy, purchase a car, looking at purchasing or signing up to get a new rental agreement with an apartment, um, it's really interesting how that's going to affect your, your overall, you know, not only interest rate, but also your ability to actually get those and receive the information that you need to accomplish that. So getting your car um, that you want and not getting a low payment as aware as as affordable payment that you can as opposed to getting some outrageous percentage rate which they try to do they try to rob people um, sometimes based on the situation so it's really mind opening uh, eye opening really if you look at that how it kind of breaks down in the pie chart all right so I like to use this example the latte factor by David Beck so what we spend our money on what can we uh, better spend elsewhere so the example is Say that you spent five dollars on a latte, okay? So that's that's comparable right about now, depending on where you go. So five dollars every day equals thirty-five dollars a week, one hundred and fifty dollars a month, okay? By investing your five dollars that you have with a ten percent return, you would have in one year you would have one thousand eight hundred eighty-five dollars. Two years, three thousand nine hundred sixty-seven dollars. Ten years, eleven thousand six hundred and sixteen dollars. 10 years, 30,727, 15, 62,171, 30 years, $339.73, and in 40 years, you would have almost a million, you would have $948,611. Now, that is pretty eye-opening if you look at this, this little, little example here, because it shows you how much things not only cost, but how much you can save if you have cost-saving um, different events like one going to the grocery store and getting your coffee and making it taking it you know going to home making your your coffee at home doing your iced coffee and then bringing it to work right great way to kind of cost reduction or finding ways where you get free 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 samples or you get free things which happens you know on occasion um, or you get the whole lovely thing that Starbucks does where you get the um, treat receipt where you can get half off in the afternoon, so that's always always a nice thing to do too as well. So there's just ways of different cost savings. So that's what it's all about. But over a lifetime, that's pretty amazing. After 40 years, half of all over half, almost a million dollars you would have saved in, in savings if you had invested that money uh, five dollars a day for a week at 10% yield. That's pretty amazing. All right. So managing your budget, making making your budget work. Um, it's always cool to track your expenses for one month. Just kind of track it for a month in a spending diary. Now, if you want, want to know what a spending diary is, we'll look at one in just a second. But I have some great templates that are in Excel sheets that you can, I can send to you, and you can actually enter your information, and it will track it stuff for you, which is very, very beneficial. So emergency savings, they really say three to six months you know, of, of your actual income you should have. Uh, Dave Ramsey is at least three months of your income. Um, that you should have in savings just in case something happens, okay? Um, and I think that's a very, very beneficial thing. Um, that's something I'm working towards right now myself personally because I think it's important to have that cushion because you never know. I mean, I didn't know that they were all going to say we're not going to get funded, and then we had to figure out what was happening. So, you know, going forward, it, it's kind of challenging, but you can make it work if you know the specifics and you, and you also use that cost reduction plan.